The following is an excerpt from the fourth volume of The History, Civil, and Commercial of the British Colonies in the West Indies, though its author Brian Edwards is speaking of the French colony of Saint-Domingue. The rebellion first broke out on a plantation called Noe, nine miles only from the city. Twelve or fourteen of the ringleaders, about the middle of the night, proceeded to the refinery, or sugar house, and seized on a young man, the refiner's apprentice, dragged him to the front of the dwelling house, and there hewed him into pieces with their cutlasses. His screams brought out the overseer, whom they instantly shot. The rebels now found their way to the apartment of the refiner and massacred him in his bed. These rebels, as Edwards describes them, made their way from there to the house of a Mr. Clement, where both he and his refiner were massacred. Then on to the plantation of a Mr. Flaville, just a few miles away, where they likewise rose and murdered five white persons. The approach of daylight served only to discover sights of horror. It was now apparent that the slaves on all the estates in the plain acted in concert, and a general massacre of the whites took place in every quarter. After some time, though, according to Edward's account, the ruffians exchanged the sword for the torch. The buildings and cane fields were everywhere set on fire, and the conflagrations, which were visible from the town in a thousand different quarters, furnished a prospect more shocking and reflections more dismal than fancy can paint or the powers of man describe. The night of August 22nd of the year 1791 was one of incredible violence. It was the night that a revolt of slaves of the French colony of Saint-Domingue began in earnest and quickly gained great ferocity. The principal difference with this particular slave revolt was that it can boast being the only successful one in history it ultimately created the first nation to banish slavery and further the first black nation, the nation of what is now called Haiti. Like any responsible student of history, it is critical in understanding the actions of August of 1791 to examine the context that preceded it. It would hardly be fair to begin the story merely with what occurred in August of 1791, now wouldn't it? Indeed, the events which preceded August of 1791 provide important insight into the motivations of the rebels, a fact that is obvious to all of us now, given the hundreds of years, the degrees of separation that allow for clarity, and not judgments based on emotion and political biases. No, given what preceded August of 1791, it is self-evident that the slaves of Saint-Domingue had very real grievances, and that their cause was not only just, but moral. The story, in the way that I'd like to tell it, begins in 1493. This was the year of Christopher Columbus's second voyage to the Americas, in which he revisited the island that would be called Hispaniola. Before long, the indigenous Taino people would be virtually wiped out, according to genocide scholar David Stannard. Just 21 years after Columbus's first landing in the Caribbean, the vastly populated island that the explorer had renamed Hispaniola was effectively desolate. A consequence of not only disease, according to Standard, but also murderous exhibitions by Spanish troops beginning in March of 1495. Besides disease and slaughter, another crucial import was introduced by Columbus, one that would cement the legacy of Hispaniola for generations to come. Sugar. It was this maneuver which helped make Saint-Domingue, modern-day Haiti, a nation comprising the western third of the island of Hispaniola, into the single main destination of the Atlantic slave trade by the late 1780s. Saint-Domingue was what the French would name their colony, which they settled in the early 17th century, taking their name from the island's capital, Santo Domingo. Saint-Domingue's wealth was staggering. No bigger than the U.S. state of Vermont, it was a powerhouse of the Atlantic economy whose exports exceeded those of the United States and were worth more than those of Brazil and Mexico combined. The island produced more sugar and more coffee than anywhere else in the world, and with this immense amount of trade, the tax revenue from this small piece of land alone funded the entire French Navy. Saint-Domingue was a fast-living colony where white Frenchmen sought to get rich quick, working up the slave economy's hierarchy of overseers, plantation attorneys, and ultimately owners, 
who could comfortably live in absentia in France while their administrators handled the day-to-day. -day. Indeed, Saint-Domingue was home to about 30,000 white colonists, and, as men outnumbered women three to one among white colonists, interracial unions ranging from the ephemeral and sordid to the occasional marriage gave rise to a large population of mixed racial descent. Their descendants were free, and along with their ex-slave counterparts, free people of color made up another tranche of about 30,000 of the population, roughly equivalent to the white colonists. As for slaves, their population was enormous. Slave traders shipped more than 200,000 Africans to Saint-Domingue in the 1780s alone. On the eve of the revolution, there were about as many slaves in Saint-Domingue than in the entire American South, nearly half a million in all, making up 90% of the population. Control was maintained, as was the entire system of slavery, through violence. Punishments were cruel and went unpunished. Slaves, after all, were property by law. Exhibitionist whippings were as much intended to terrorize other slaves as they were to torture their victims. French historian Pierre de Vassier gave gut-wrenching detail of slave reprisals in his history of Saint-Domingue. Pepper, salt, lemon, ashes, quicklime would be poured into open whip wounds. Or perhaps gunpowder would be placed inside their rectum, which was lit with a wick. There are, I assure you, many other atrocities to speak of, far, far worse than what I've just described. Even absent these indignities, slaves had been ferried from their homeland under the deck of a slave ship in the most horrid conditions imaginable. This was their introduction to life in Saint-Domingue. Upon arrival, they were branded as though they were livestock, and each time they were sold thereafter, they were branded again and again. They worked sun up to sundown six days a week, or if they were on the sugar plantations, into the night as well, digging canals, tilling, planting, harvesting. A Swiss traveler named Gilles Chantran spent a year in northern Saint-Domingue in the early 1780s. He provides valuable insight into slave life free from French colonial bias. On a large, well-managed sugar plantation, the work never stops. Either the ripened canes need to be cut or a field needs replanting after being harvested. Tired by the heat and the weight of their pickaxes, and by a heavy soil baked hard enough to break their tools, they made great efforts to overcome every obstacle. A gloomy silence reigned among them. Pain was visible on every face, but the hour of rest never came. The manager watched the working without pity, and several slave drivers armed with long whips mixed in among the workers dealt out harsh blows, men and women, young and old, without distinction. This European gentleman himself couldn't help but express his disgust at the condition of the slaves. Could a European fresh from the charming countryside of Switzerland gaze on that of Saint-Domingue without getting angry? At the debasement of the men used here, their suffering and extreme poverty? At the enormous chains they have to drag around if they commit a small fault, as if their daily work is not already exhausting enough? The powers in Paris had, in fact, done nothing to improve the lot of the slaves, and were not about to, but that would change once the slaves took action on their own. On the evening of August 14th of the year 1791, great numbers of slaves, many acting as delegates for their plantations, convened a meeting in the woods of bois Caillemont. The ceremony was led by a slave named Bookman. Duddy Bookman, as he was called, would emerge as the first leader of the rebellion. Their spiritual leader, Bookman, was a voodoo priest. Voodoo's contribution to the revolution remains controversial, but it assuredly included grassroots organization, a sense of solidarity, and of invulnerability in combat, and leadership at different levels. At the ceremony, Bookman was quoted as saying, among other things, the following, "'Throw away the image of the god of the whites, who thirst for our tears, and listen to the voice of liberty that speaks in the hearts of all of us. Thereafter, the participants of the meeting swore an oath of secrecy and revenge. The pact would be sealed by the sacrificial slaughter of a pig, whose blood was drank by the attendees. The plan that they had made required careful coordination among large numbers of slaves who were to rise up and start the burning and killing in unison. The date set for the event was, as best we can tell, 
the night of Wednesday, August 24th. Perhaps unable to contain themselves, the events which unfolded at the Noe plantation occurred two days early. Plundering masters' homes, destroying the infrastructure of the plantations on which they were enslaved, and killing those who had enslaved them, were powerful ways to pursue liberty. Indeed, they were the only ways available to most of the slaves. We can only imagine the exuberance and exhilaration the rebels must have felt as they took vengeance, turned the tables on their masters, and saw, perhaps for the first time, the extent of their power. Of course, it was only a matter of time before a counteroffensive was launched, a fact undoubtedly known to all of the rebels. They proved themselves to be a worthy and terrifying adversary. Let us turn our attention back to Brian Edwards' testimony, where he details the utter carnage of the revolt period, what he calls an exterminating war. Within two months after the revolt began, upwards of 2,000 white persons of all conditions and ages had been massacred. 180 sugar plantations and about 900 coffee, cotton, and indigo settlements had been destroyed, the buildings therein being consumed by fire. Of the insurgents, it was reckoned that upwards of 10,000 had perished by the sword or by famine, and some hundreds by the hands of the executioner, many of them, I am sorry to say, under the torture of the wheel, a system of revenge and retaliation which no enormities of savage life could justify or excuse. Edwards was referring to the practice known as breaking at the wheel, where an unlucky victim is tied to a scaffold, perhaps a wagon wheel, and beaten to death typically as painfully as possible by targeting limbs and joints. Edward's opinion that there was no excuse for such a brutal practice was informed by him witnessing two men being executed in this way. Two of these unhappy men suffered in this manner under the window of the author's lodgings and in his presence at Cap Francois on Thursday, the 18th of September, 1791. They were broken on two pieces of timber placed crosswise one of them expired on receiving the third stroke on his stomach, each of his legs and arms having been first broken in two places. The first three blows he bore without a groan. The other had a harder fate. When the executioner, after breaking his legs and arms, lifted up the instrument to give the finishing stroke on the breast, and which, by putting the criminal out of his pain, is called le coup de crasse, the mob, with the ferociousness of cannibals, called out arrêté, and compelled him to leave his work unfinished. In that condition, the miserable wretch, with his broken limbs doubled up, was put on a cartwheel, which was placed horizontally, one end of the axle being driven into the earth. He seemed perfectly sensible, but uttered not a groan. At the end of forty minutes, some English seamen, who were spectators of the tragedy, strangled him in mercy. A Captain Bickford of Salem, Massachusetts, a witness to the early days of the Revolution, was quoted at the time in the Philadelphia General Advertiser. The country is filled with dead bodies, which lie unburied. The slaves have left the whites with stakes driven through them into the ground, and the white troops, who now take no prisoners, but kill everything black or yellow, leave the slaves dead upon the field. Though despite these brutal measures, the rebels held their own. Indeed, the French appear to have been experiencing an all-too-familiar problem that would plague all occupying and colonial powers throughout history, that of the enduring guerrilla. In the words of a Madame de Rouvray, we kill many of them, and they seem to reproduce themselves out of their ashes. They were armed with guns, knives, sticks, and all the sharp utensils of kitchen and of farm. Some were nude, some in tatters, and some grotesquely decked in the rich apparel taken from our wardrobes. They had, as artillery, fifteen cannon taken from our villages. Over time, the rebel slaves came to acquire more arms, until they became well armed with muskets and swords. They organized themselves into regular bodies. They made liberal use of hit-and-run, ambush attacks, and psychological warfare. This has been attributed to a crucial fact about the rebel slaves. On the eve of the revolution, of the half a million slaves in Saint-Domingue, two-thirds of them were not only black, they were born in Africa. These were enslaved prisoners of war, and by 1791, 
Only a minority of French troops had ever actually seen combat before. The Africans, diverse in their backgrounds, speaking up to a dozen languages in a single plantation, were a lot alike in this regard. The French as well, up to that point, certainly were not trained in guerrilla warfare and were not privy to many of its central tenets. European armies were only just beginning to learn backwoods practices like firing from behind cover or in a prone position, and scattering instead of standing upright when being shot at. With ambushes, psychological warfare, and hit-and-run tactics, the insurgents compensated for their lack of firearms. They never fought out in the open or bunched together. A thousand blacks would never confront a hundred whites in open country, but they would advance making a terrible noise at first. Though after having got quite close to their enemy, but still out of range, they would fall completely silent. They distributed their troops by platoons in all the overgrown places, so that they seemed six times more numerous than they really were. The bravery of these Africans is unbelievable. One fascinating letter from a 16-year-old French girl to her American stepmother describes how her own father came under a rebel assault. Papa left last Monday with 300 men of the National Guard. At 8 o'clock in the evening, Papa was attacked. Some of the guardsmen throwed themselves in the sea. Papa's guide, a black man, was pulling them out by the feet and crying, Get a hold of yourselves. Some have horns, others have broken kettles, and they try to make as much noise as possible in order to confuse and frighten whites. Papa says that it was impossible to hear oneself. Finally, on the 29th of August of the year 1793, one year and one week after the slave rebellion, a landmark proclamation was issued by Commissioner Léger Félicité Santonax, the world's first abolition of slavery, and the only one in response to a slave rebellion, a landmark in the history of the Americas. In doing so, the French acquired an important ally, one who would radically alter the course of not only the history of Haiti, but the history of the world. I am Toussaint Louverture. My name is perhaps known to you. I have undertaken vengeance. I want liberty and equality to reign in Saint-Domingue. When he joined the resistance in 1791, Toussaint Louverture was already a free man. According to Louverture's son Isaac, who became an important source of information on his life, Toussaint was born in 1746, the grandson of an Arada prince. He was born Toussaint Preda after the slaveholding family that owned him. Fortunately for him, by 1776, Toussaint was emancipated. After leaving the Breda plantation, Toussaint adopted the name Louverture, meaning the opening. Its origins are disputed, though perhaps it denoted his newfound role as a freedom fighter. Toussaint's loyalties at the onset of the revolution were understandably not with the French forces. He would eventually join the Spanish, who had declared war on France in 1792. Hispaniola would soon become swarming with colonial armies, for as a result of the ongoing French Revolution, King Louis XVI was executed, and the Republicans declared war on England. France, Spain, and now England all wanted a peace. Though after the abolition of slavery in Saint-Domingue, or after Toussaint had laid eyes directly on the proclamation not wanting to leave anything to hearsay, Louverture would join France and become a formidable ally. It wouldn't be long until Spain sued for peace with France in 1795, and after waging a ruthless campaign against the remaining British, Toussaint Louverture had successfully expelled them by 1798. Having defeated all of his colonial rivals, Toussaint became governor general of Saint-Domingue. The enormous power that he wielded, and his increasing autonomy from France's rule, created some animosity with French leaders, especially one in particular who would wrest power through a coup d'état in 1799. Under his rule, France would wage war against its wealthy sugar colony. In her memoirs, Josephine wrote about her husband Napoleon Bonaparte's decision to send his army to Saint-Domingue, something she called a fatal move that would forever take this beautiful colony away from France. Keep Toussaint Louverture there. That is the man that you require in order to govern the blacks. It's an ominous quote, given what transpired afterward. It's hardly controversial to suggest that, had Louverture been allowed to govern on behalf of the French, it would have ended far better for them. Indeed, Louverture was hardly a radical. He emancipated the slaves, but he militarized plantation work 
making it a crime to leave the plantations in which they were enslaved. The only difference now, really, was that they were wage slaves. Despite his wife's pleas, Napoleon Bonaparte could not stomach Louverture's bold constitution, which he signed in July of 1801, which he then sent to Napoleon directly. In naming himself Governor General for Life, Napoleon said, Toussaint knew very well that he had thrown away his mask and had drawn his sword out of its sheath forever. Though it's important to note with regard to the Haitian Revolution that in many ways and at various stages, calling it a racial war is somewhat reductive. Alliances were plenty and complicated. After all, Toussaint Louverture fought for Spain and France, as did thousands of other black rebels. It was Napoleon Bonaparte, however, who insisted on invoking race as his motivation. Rid us of these gilded Negroes, Bonaparte wrote to his expedition leader Charles Leclerc in July 1802, disarm the blacks. It was him who called the fighting force a crusade of civilized people of the West against the black barbarism. Not to be misinterpreted, he clarified, I am for the whites because I am white. I have no other reason and that one is good. His expedition consisted of some 50 ships, half of France's large naval vessels. Aboard them were 22,000 soldiers and 20,000 sailors. The total number sent to Saint-Domingue would balloon to upwards of 80,000 men. Toussaint Louverture, upon seeing the French Armada, rallied his own troops, perhaps as many as 30,000 by early 1802, aside from the local militias numbering in the thousands as well. After being fired on by black rebels in northern Saint-Domingue, near Le Cap, General Donatien-Marie-Joseph de Rochambeau captured the garrison. Rochambeau had lost 60 men and made sure to exact revenge to make an example of the black troops and proceeded to massacre hundreds of them. Rochambeau was only debuting the French strategy, yet another war of extermination. However, the French yet again found themselves ill-prepared for the war waged against them by the Africans. The enemy held nowhere, and yet never ceased to be the masters of the country. The French had made devastating progress in a short period of time. After capturing Le Cap, they wrested the northern peninsula from Louverture's forces, though they would take to the mountains in the wilderness, burning and sabotaging as they withdrew. Tear up the roads, throw corpses and horses into all the fountains, burn and annihilate everything so that those who have come to return us to slavery will always find in front of them the image of the hell they deserve. Though Louverture was a shrewd military planner, he was perhaps eclipsed in harshness by his mysterious underling. In the port town of Saint-Marc, Jean-Jacques Desalines led his troops by example, setting fire to his own recently completed mansion. Barrels of gunpowder and alcohol were placed throughout the town to aid a rapid flame. Desalines also took hundreds of French prisoners, and by the time the French arrived to saint Marc's smoldering ruins, they also found hundreds of their own scattered throughout. Desalines then embarked for Port-au-Prince, taking several hundred white prisoners. These included Michel de Corti, a physician kept along for his expertise, which the rebels doubtless thought that they could exploit. He would later write of the horror show that was life as a prisoner under Desalines. By the time Desalines had reached the mountains, he had very few white prisoners with him. Louverture questioned Desalines, what happened to all of your prisoners? Oh, said Desalines, they were killed in battle or escaped. But de Corti said otherwise. He said Desalines slaughtered them by the hundreds. This was corroborated by General Pamphile Lacroix, who said he had found eight hundred corpses in Verret, while pursuing Desalines' retreating troops. This wasn't the only pile of bodies that he'd find. Seeking to spare his troops from the stench of one group of bodies piled up near their camp and lacking shovels to build a mass grave, he burned them. Instead of removing the odor, this move filled the air with an even more acrid smell, one he was never able to remove from his clothes. As surprising as it may sound given the said gruesome details, mass killing was the least of the French army's worries. A more insidious problem plagued them, disease. The yellow fever appeared suddenly, causing sharp pains in the eye sockets, feet, loins, and stomach. A thick, whitish-yellow fluid covered the parched tongue, then the teeth, and soon changed into a black encrustation. The pulse became elevated, 
the regurgitations yellow from bile, the feces and urine red. He was already a corpse, putrid and horrible from the blood's decomposition. Deaths from disease apparently reached a massive 120 per day, owing to a miscalculation by Bonaparte. Thinking that the expedition would be a quick victory, he deployed them at the beginning of 1802. But the war grinded on. The looming summer months were steadily approaching, until the noxious epidemics ruptured from the earth. Still a prisoner of Desilines, de Corti recorded what are some of the only words of his that still survive to this day. The whites from France cannot hold out against us here in Saint-Domingue. They will fight well at first, but soon they will fall sick and die like flies. Toussaint Louverture's fortunes would change in a most unexpected way. One of his most trusted allies, Henri Christophe, commander of the Northern Plain, surrendered to Leclerc. It wouldn't be long until Louverture did the same. Finding his position severely compromised, it was a massive betrayal. Louverture signed an agreement at Le Cap, where he would surrender in return for keeping his military rank and returning to his plantation at Anari. Leclerc had pardoned Toussaint, and the latter had pledged his loyalty to France. Leclerc had given his word of honor. It was a lie. Upon visiting the home of General Jean-Baptiste Brunet, General Leclerc entered, accompanied by a large number of soldiers who surrounded me, seized me, bound me as a criminal, and conducted me on board the frigate Creole. As he boarded the ship that would bring him to his exile, he exclaimed, In overthrowing me, you have cut down, in Saint-Domingue, only the trunk of the tree of the liberty of the blacks. It will grow from the roots, because they are deep and numerous. Louverture withered away and finally died a year later in a freezing dungeon in France on April 7th, 1803. This would prove to be yet another miscalculation on the part of Napoleon, who had sealed the fate of the French. For Toussaint Louverture was merely replaced by his brutal partner, Jean-Jacques Desalines. Unbeknownst to Leclerc up to that point, since he believed Desalines would be a valuable asset, Leclerc even sent him on a mission to disarm the population. However, after publicly confiscating arms, he covertly rearmed the population all while stocking up on ammunition. Desalines' belief that he would soon have to take up arms against the French once again was understandable. Indeed, when France reinstituted slavery in the island colony of Guadeloupe, news couldn't be contained for long. This fact confirmed everyone's suspicions of what the true plans were for Napoleon's officers. And sure enough, Desalines attacked French troops in Gonaïve, sending the soldiers into retreat to their ships in the harbor. He told them, return to Europe. Leclerc sought to rein in the black soldiers through genocide. In order to control the mountains, once I have finally completed the job, I will have to destroy all the food crops and a large proportion of the cultivators. I will need to wage a war of extermination. Leclerc's target was the black population of Saint-Domingue, including those who fought in his ranks. In Le Cap, he had 1,000 colonial troops arrested, loaded onto ships, and pushed overboard with large sacks of flour tied around their necks. A contemporary witness, Jean-Pierre Bichot, corroborated the practice. Drowning is the usual way of putting to death black prisoners. I've been told that, on several occasions, thousands were drowned at the same time, and their bodies were often seen floating. Like many unsuccessful campaigns against insurgencies, the rebels had cleverly utilized their many advantages, their fighting edge, their mastery of the wilderness and mountains, disease, sabotage, scorched earth, all to bleed the occupiers. This strategy worked. Half of the officers in this army are dead, wrote Leclerc in summer 1802. Men passed through and disappeared like shadows, recalled Lacroix. Armed with muskets, the rebels also scored casualties using tactics from the old slave rebellion days. They laid traps. Pits dug into the ground were covered with branches, leaves, on the bottom lay boards studded with nails. Rocks or tree limbs might be placed in front of them, prompting soldiers to jump over them, landing hard into the bed of nails. By 1803, Desalines had effectively consolidated his power over most of the rebels in the colony. Under his command, he'd unify hundreds of local leaders, an astonishing feat, and with their help, they continued to bleed the French, and drove them out of most of the colony. Their coup d'etat finally came in May, 
when peace between Britain and France fell through, no reinforcement would be coming for them now. A song from the period was passed down generation after generation, recording the march toward victory of Desalines' troops. Desalines is leaving the north. Come see what he is bringing. He is bringing cannons to chase away the whites. In November, Desalines directed a final attack on French positions outside Le Cap. On the 18th of the month, Desalines sat on a stone, holding his snuff box, and watched as his troops took the final, crucial hill conquering a country, a nation, for his entire race. Cojambeau at long last acquiesced and accepted defeat. After negotiating a surrender, several thousand troops, along with white residents of Le Cap, sailed out of the harbor. Behind them were some 50,000 dead. A majority of the soldiers and sailors who had been sent to Saint-Domingue had died. On New Year's Day, of the year 1804, Jean-Jacques Desalines, now emperor, declared independence for the new nation of Haiti, thought to be the old Arawak name for the island. Among the declaration's words were the following ominous statements. Citizens, it is not enough to have expelled the barbarians who have bloodied our land for two centuries. It is not enough to have restrained those ever-evolving factions that one after another mocked the specter of liberty that France dangled before you. We must, with one last act of national authority, forever assure the empire of liberty in the country of our birth. We must take any hope of re-enslaving us away from the inhuman government that for so long kept us in the most humiliating torpor. In the end, we must live independent or die. When will we tire of breathing the air that they breathe? What do we have in common with this nation of executioners? The difference between its cruelty and our patient moderation, its color and ours, the great seas that separate us, our avenging climate, all tell us plainly that they are not our brothers, that they never will be, and that if they find refuge among us, they will plot again to trouble and divide us. These tigers, still dripping with their blood, whose terrible presence indicts your lack of feeling and your guilty slowness in avenging them, what are you waiting for before appeasing their spirits? What followed this proclamation is somewhat disputed. He ordered a series of massacres of white inhabitants, although precisely how many perished is difficult to establish. Between February and May 1804, several thousand of the remaining French were systematically massacred in two waves, men first, women and children afterwards. It was then that the complete massacre took place. The population, stirred to fear at the nearness of the counter-revolution, killed all with every possible brutality. After the first slaughter, Desalines issued a proclamation promising pardon to all who were in hiding. They came out and were immediately killed. On April 28th, Desalines himself had issued a proclamation, which seemed to indicate that something significant had indeed occurred. Finally, the hour of vengeance has struck, and the implacable enemies of the rights of man have received the punishment their crimes deserved. Yes, we have rendered onto those true cannibals, war for war, crimes for crime, outrage for outrage. Yes, I have saved my country. I have avenged America. <laughs>